Okay, um, so tonight we're going to be introducing you to the jhanas. Some of you have already made contact. Um, and also talk a little bit about mindfulness uh, instead of going through the entire Satipatthana Sutta. Um, I'm just going to go through, actually there's a little section in my book that uh, I was reading and I was like, oh, that's, that's pretty good stuff. Let me, let me use that. <laughs> you know, spent a lot of time with this. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit from there. Um, so people talk a lot about mindfulness and w they assume they know what it is. But uh, I think Bhante said once, he said, there was a big meeting of people, uh, mindfulness teachers, and um, somebody said, does, can anybody give a definition of mindfulness? And nobody really could. They all tried, but they couldn't really agree on it. And I think they're still trying to figure that out. But the definition from the suttas is it is watching mind's attention. It, the Pali word is sati. And sati means watching how the mind moves from one thing to another. Now, what mindfulness has come to represent is, I think, based on, and this is my own opinion, the Pali was translated, and a Burmese was translated, I suppose, in the 1800s by people named Reese Davies and other folks who did not, they didn't know what this meditation was, but they tried to translate the uh, the Pali and the language that it was in. There's a lot of words that the Buddha came up with that there are no English words, that there are concepts that um, the Buddha found that are not, they don't exist in the English language or any other language for that matter. And one of those is, is uh, sati, or mindfulness. Um, what we think is mindfulness is, you know, I, I remember uh, in London, uh, be mindful of the door. Or, um, you know, you have to be, what, what is it again? Mind the gap. Mind the gap. And you could say, be mindful of the gap, you know. And mindful, in other words, Pay attention to where you're going. But that's not mindfulness. That's paying attention to a particular thing, not how things are moving in the mind. So this entire system of mindfulness that is out there could have been created from the fact that it was translated wrong and that we could have an entire system that is meditating on this idea of mindfulness that they think came from the Buddha, but actually came from the translators. Just my opinion, possibility. Now what the Buddha really meant is watching mind's attention. And what this is up on the wall, the six R's, is mindfulness. And it's also the four right efforts. But mindfulness is recognizing your mind has moved. <coughs> and then the right effort comes in, release it, relax, uh, re-smile, bringing up wholesome objects and so forth. But it's that recognized step that you've noticed the mind is no longer here and now it's here. And what we're doing with the meditation is watching how the mind is constantly moving and finding out that the moving is craving. It's craving. It's tanha. And we relax that tanha. We, we calm it down. Now, what, what is it that we're watching? We're watching the five hindrances. 
uh, we're watching sensual desire, number one. We're watching hatred or aversion. We're watching sloth and torpor. We're watching restlessness, worry, or anxiety. We're watching doubt. Uh, doubt in the teacher, in the practice, or the Buddha, or doubt in yourself. So all of these things are part of the mind moving around. So what we're trying to accomplish is, of course, trying to eliminate those hindrances by relaxing and releasing those hindrances. And, of course, that is the six R's. Now, what, what is the result of releasing and relaxing the hindrances? Well, when they disappear, the state of jhana arises. Now, what, is, um, what does jhana mean? Jhana, uh, as defined by Venerable Punaji of Malaysia, and this is the guy who told Bhante when he came to Malaysia after he was just he was done with Burmese Vipassana, he says, I'm not going to practice it anymore. I don't think it works. And so he went to Malaysia and they said, oh, you're, you're a, a master in Vipassana. He says, well, maybe, but I'm not going to teach it. But I will teach you, teach you loving kindness. So he started teaching loving kindness. Now, uh, he got hold of Venerable Punaji and they had some discussions about what was going on and, and his, um, you know, his disappointment that he was not understanding or not getting what he was looking for, which is personality change and the elimination of craving. And Venerable Punaji said, why don't you just forget about everything that you're reading and go back to the suttas? Those are commentaries. Those are written by monks or lay people, mostly monks, that are like 1,500 years later. This is called the Vasudhimaga. And as, the, as Buddhism went ahead in, into, into the future, people changed things. And they said, well, if we add this, it'll be better, and if we do this, and actually forget what it is now. Let's go back and look at what yo the yogic masters were doing and we'll do that, and that will be more effective. So everybody has their own idea of what works. And believe me, in the TWIM system, I've seen people start to add and subtract as well. Um, they shouldn't do that. They need to stay with the instructions as it is, as Bhante is teaching us, and as it is in the suttas. But in any case, that has happened. And so Punaji says, and that's Punaji right up there. That's why he has a place of respect next to Bhante, because he said, Bhante, go back to the suttas. You're going to find the answer there. He had some descriptions of Pali that were quite interesting. Um, the word jhana, which is translated as a state of concentration, that's not correct from the viewpoint of Twim. Uh, Punaji said that jhana actually just means level just means a state, a state or a level, and, or a state of meditation. So it doesn't mean like grabbing down on an object and just focusing. It just means you're in a certain state. He also offered an alternate definition of the related word of samadhi. Now everybody's probably heard, or maybe not, of samadhi which is often considered and used to de define a state of absorption concentration. And I know when I was growing up in meditation, I heard the word samadhi and I thought, wow, that's concentration, that's cosmic consciousness. That's, you know, that's what I want. But it turns out samadhi isn't really that, that the Buddha came up with this word. And this is what Punaji said, that th this was... Um, a word created by the Buddha, and it means sama, which means equal or even, and the word d in Pali can mean state. So it's an even state. It's a state of balance. It's The word samadhi implies a collected and unified state 
but not deep absorption that suppresses the hindrances. It is more an open and aware state. Now, Bhante defines jhana as a level of understanding. Each successive jhana is an increasingly deeper level of understanding. Now, Bhante Vilmaramsi uses collectedness, not concentration. Also, Bhante found that in Pali, the word D may also be translated as wisdom. I have the Pali dictionary upstairs. It shows D can be wisdom. So what does that make samadhi? Tranquil wisdom. Twim. <laughs> so we're practicing samadhi. And uh, it's a little different than what others are practicing. But let's go to the suttas to find out. In the Anguttara Nikaya, AN 9.37, by Ananda. Um, At one time, Venerable Ananda was staying near Kasambi in Gosita's monastery. There, Ananda addressed the mendicants, reverence, mendicants, well, let's call them monks. Reverend, they replied. Ananda said this, It's incredible, reverence. It's amazing how this blessed one who knows and sees the perfected one, the fully awakened Buddha, has found an opening in a confined space. It's in order to purify sentient beings, to get past sorrow and crying, to make an end of pain and sadness, to end the cycle of suffering, and to realize extinguishment. The eye itself is actually present, and so are these sights. Yet one will not experience the sense field. The ear itself is actually present, and so are those sounds. Yet one will not experience that sense field. The nose itself is actually present, and so are those smells. Yet one will not experience that sense field. The tongue itself is actually present, and so are those tastes. Yet one will not experience that sense field. The body itself is actually present, and so are those touches. Yet one will not experience a sense field. When he said this, Venerable Udayi said to Venerable Ananda, Reverend Ananda, is one who doesn't experience that sense field actually percipient or not? Reverend, one who doesn't experience that sense field is actually percipient. Not, perci- not non-percipient. But what does one who doesn't experience that sense field perceive? It is when a monk going totally beyond perceptions of form with the endings of perceptions of impingement, not focusing on perceptions of diversity, aware that space is infinite, enters and remains in the dimension of infinite space. Who, one who doesn't experience that sense field perceives in that way. Furthermore, a monk going totally beyond the dimension of infinite space. Now we're talking about the Arupa Jhanas here. Aware that consciousness is infinite. There, there's a point to all of this, so well, let's get through it here. Enters and remains in the dimension of infinite consciousness. One who doesn't experience a sense field perceives in this way. Reverend, one time I was staying near Sakita in the deer park in Anjana Wood. Then the nun Jatilagahika came up to me and bowed and stood to one side and said to me, Sir Ananda, regarding the immersion that does not lean forward or pull back and is not held in place by forceful suppression, being free, it's stable, being stable, it's content. Being content, one is not anxious. What did the Buddha say was the fruit of this immersion? When she said this, I said to her, Sister, regarding the immersion that does not lean forward or pull back and is not held in place by forceful suppression, being free, it's stable. Being stable, it's content. Being content, one is not anxious. The Buddha said that the fruit of this immersion is enlightenment. One who doesn't experience that sense field perceives in this way. 
So, so the point of all of this is that there's a phrase here that says, talking about immersion, we're talking about the, the states of jhana. And it says that the mind is not, the attention is not held in place by forceful suppression. Being free, it's stable. It's not held, but because it just is, it sits there, it's because the hindrances have been relaxed and now it just sits on the object. Now, every other practice is going to say, we got to get rid of these hindrances, we got to eliminate them, and we got to push them aside, and I need you to really try really hard to do that. And you got to clench your teeth and put the tongue on the roof of your mouth and just use a lot of effort. Now, the Buddha never said that. The, the yogic masters who said, that's the way to yogic concentration. That is what they said. That you have to do that kind of suppression. You have to, the, the mind sees a hindrance and it just bats it away and says, nope, not going to pay attention. Now, it works because what happens is you develop what's called access concentration. I've, I've experienced that. It's an amazing state. There's no hindrances. Your mind is completely pure in the sense that it's, it's pushed things away. There is a it's, a, it's a very energetic state. And you feel like, wow, there's nothing left to do. But the problem is, we need to see those hindrances. We need to understand that what, it, what is causing our suffering are those hindrances. It is craving. So you don't want to push away craving and then there's no craving left to understand and to relax and let go. So that's why that's where the Buddha differed from other practices. And that's where the Buddha uses the tranquilized step. In the Anapanasati Sutta and the Satipatthana Sutta, it says right there, you breathe in, you know that you're breathing in, and you know that you're breathing out. And everybody says, okay. Oh, that's good. So they they watch their breath. But they focus on it and they're mindful of it. Mindful meaning they're concentrating on it. When you actually properly follow the breath in, as the way the Buddha taught it, he adds after that, you tranquilize on the in-breath and you tranquilize on the out-breath. That means you relax. So you know that you're breathing, you just know, I'm breathing, and you relax. And when it comes in, you relax. When it goes out, you relax. In other words, you're kind of 6 ring at the end of every breath. And when the mind starts to wander, you relax. And so pretty soon, you're just with the breath, you're not concentrating on it, there's no huge lights that are, that are arising, you're just completely here in the present. And that's, that's how you do breath with the twin system. But in the sutta, it says you tranquilize the bodily formation and you tranquilize the mental formation. And the mental formation is what? Thoughts. Thoughts that come up. So that's how you do that. Now, there's the samadhi sutta. Um, it's labeled, of course, concentration but we like to say collectedness. It's Angutra 5.27. Students, being alert and mindful, develop concentration that is measureless. When alert and mindful, you develop concentration that is measureless. The knowledge arises that it is personally yours. This concentration is peaceful and sublime, gained by full tranquilization and attained to unification. The mind just sits there, total unity occurs. You're not holding it in place. There's no energy to take it away. It is not reined in and checked by forcefully suppressing the defilements. And it's right there, Samadhi Sutta. But everybody else will see, it. well, it's just, you know, you relax your body. Or No, it's much deeper than that. Okay. 
So these are the jhana states that you're developing with your meditation by letting go of hindrances. And there are uh, eight, there's actually four jhanas. And the fourth jhana is, um, it is four, it's cut into four different pieces. So we call it, sometimes we call it eight jhanas, we call it four jhanas. And the the uh, formless jhanas are the arupa jhanas. The rupa jhanas are the first four, the arupa are the next four, and they're also called the ayatana or the base. Um, but what we're going to do now, and I have a chart of the jhanas that you'll be going through, and what what the characteristics are, and we're going to have a video by Delson, and Delson's going to give you the lowdown of every single piece of the jhana, and so you and and it's it's quite clear, and I think I think you'll enjoy the video.